Today, we tend to take for granted the rights we enjoy as citizens. But back in territorial days, Arizonans were little more than second-class residents of the United States. As living in Arizona, they couldn't vote for president. Their governors were appointed in Washington, D.C. They could pass laws in the territorial legislature, but they had to be subject to approval by the Congress in Washington, D.C. Now, Arizona became a territory of the nation in 1863, after spending 13 years as a part of the territory of New Mexico, as it was called, and it did include all of what became New Mexico. Within a few years, the citizens were clamoring for statehood. They wanted to become a state. They cited an American precedent that allowed full partnership in the Union after apprenticing first as a territory. However, Arizona had earned quite a reputation for lawlessness, and many people in the eastern part of the United States felt that this territory was too wild for statehood. And in southern Arizona, a loose-knit band of rustlers was terrorizing Cochise County and northern Mexico. And Geronimo and his band of Chiricahua Apaches continued to have raids throughout the territory of Arizona, and they did not surrender until 1886. In Pleasant Valley, Arizona, there was a feud going on between the Grams and the Tewksburys. And that feud ended up taking the lives of some 20 to 50 men before the last man died with his boots on. Now, all of this, of course, provided pulp writers across the nation with plenty of material. On March 26, 1893, an Eastern newspaper in the U.S. printed as a news item a story that took place in Big Hat, Arizona. Now, that piece in the paper told of two ruffians having a shootout in the street. Each one blazed away at the other with the gun. Now, the truth is there never was a town in Arizona called Big Hat, and no such gunfight ever took place. So Arizonans were having a hard time finding respectability with that kind of irresponsible press. By the 1890s, most of the territory was relatively quiet and tame. When the United States went to war with Spain in 1898, Arizonans quickly raised two companies of cavalry troops led by Jim McClintock and Bucky O'Neill. For they wanted to serve for Teddy Roosevelt's um, Rough Riders. And they fought two major battles and led the charge up San Juan Hill in, during that war. And the Arizonans lost Captain O'Neill just before the final battle. But they returned home to the United States with high hopes for statehood, only to be told that the place was nothing but an uninhabitable desert full of cactus, rattlesnakes, and scorpions. No need to become a state, they were told. In 1904, a bill was introduced in Congress to merge Arizona and New Mexico into one state with the capital in Santa Fe. The Arizonans were pretty unhappy about that. They were outraged. Fortunately, an amendment was added to that bill stating that both territories, Arizona and New Mexico, had to approve or it wouldn't pass. Now, New Mexico voted in favor of it, but the Arizonans voted overwhelmingly against that piece of legislation. When their old comrade in arms, now he had become President Theodore Roosevelt, and he came out in support of joint statehood. The Arizonans retaliated by threatening to change the name of Roosevelt Street to Cleveland Street. 
finally, Congress passed the Enabling Act, and the two territories, Arizona and New Mexico, held constitutional conventions. The New Mexicans wrote a conservative, acceptable constitution for the state, but the Arizonans, once again, went against the grain. They had the nerve, the gall, to include measures in the Arizona proposed constitution, such as direct primary elections, and to provide for laws started by initiative measure and to include provisions for making referendums and for the recall of elected officials. But the women's suffrage proposal failed to pass despite a 10-foot long petition from Gila County for it and a picture postcard showing a woman and child standing next to a drunk man lying in the gutter with the caption, this man can vote, this woman cannot. That measure did pass two years later. The Arizonans were warned that President, then President Taft, William Howard Taft, who was a former judge, they were told that he would veto the Arizona Constitution because it included a provision for the recall of judges but Arizona stubbornly refused to back down. On August the 11th, 1911, the, er, the president vetoed the Arizona statehood bill. They got advice, Arizona got advice, take that provision out and when statehood is granted, put it back in, they were told. Well, that's what Arizona did and the president was ready to sign the statehood bill on February 12th. But somebody pointed out that the 12th was a holiday. It was Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And the 13th might be unlucky. You know we're always scared of the 13th of the month. So the Arizona statehood bill was signed on Valentine's Day, February the 14th. And after that, that provision for the recall of officials was reinstated and the Arizonans got their revenge in the election of 1912 when former President Taft finished fourth in the state behind Woodrow Wilson, Teddy Roosevelt, and Eugene Debs. Now Arizona had remained a territory rather than a state for 49 years, longer than any other. California to the west was never a territory, it just became a state. And our neighbor to the north, Nevada, was a territory for only three years. So the road to statehood for Arizona was long and difficult. Earlier, Senator Thomas Bard of California had said that Arizonans were not intelligent enough to become a state. Some Eastern pundit wrote, that Arizonans were so uncultured and coarse, so unchurched and unwashed, that it would be at least a century before one would have an impact on Washington, D.C. And so our new state's immediate response to that kind of nonsense was to send to Washington, D.C. Carl Hayden and Henry Ashurst as senators from this new state. And decades later, they were followed by Ernest McFarland and then Barry Goldwater. John Rhodes and Moe and Stuart Udall also emerged from Arizona to hold office. And William Rehnquist and Sandra Day O'Connor became justices on the United States Supreme Court.